Hello, everybody, and welcome to another beautiful Thursday morning. You're listening to Bhavani at IE Green on the Progressive Radio Network. And I'm really thrilled today to introduce to you, my guest will be Dr. Vandana Shiva. She is an amazing uh, food activist, and I will be telling you more about her in just a little bit before she comes on. But first, I want to go over some things going on in the news that I want to share with you. Uh, talk to you a little bit about the pesticide forum that I attended this past weekend, and also some things that I would like to ask you all to take some action in. So first off, uh, this Beyond Pesticide Forum that I went to at the Academy of Medicine this past weekend was eye-opening. I mean, I've been following um, the contamination of pesticides in our food system for a really long time, but the level of contamination was just is way beyond what I even thought. It's in everything, every single step of our food system, starting from the soil, contamination of the soil, contamination of the seeds, um, the spraying that they do as they're growing it. Then they're spraying it before harvesting to dry it quicker. It's just everywhere. And it's in our food system on all levels. And even when we're buying organic, we don't have complete um, complete safety from pesticides. And so it's just really important that we all know that it exists and we all do what we can to push our legislators to establish regulation to do away with it. There's more and more studies being done that are showing us that we can feed the world without industrial agriculture. Industrial agriculture has not proven to be the remedy that it was promised to be during the Green Revolution. It has not given us more yield. It has not made more money for the farmers. In actuality, it's done the reverse. Um, yields are down. Um, our whole food system, you know, and the way we subsidize things and the way we overproduce and the way food companies are pushing food on us, the whole system is just so wrong. And um, it really needs to be reevaluated and really looked at. And we need our governmental officials to really do that. And they're only going to do it if they hear enough outcry from us. So it's really, really important that we all show up when we can and get out there and make them hear us, make them, you know, make our protests so loud. I mean, right now they are introducing the first um, GMO salmon into our food system. Okay. GMO salmon, genetically modified salmon has been approved and it does not require labeling. So now when you go to a store to buy salmon, if you're buying farm raised salmon, you don't know if it's been genetically modified or not. And what that does when it's been genetically modified, I have a great picture on my, um, you know, this week's newsletter, you know, showing a salmon at 18 months of age, one that's genetically modified and one that's normal. The genetically modified one is 24 inches long. The normal one is 13 inches long. The weight of a genetically modified one is 6.6 .6 pounds. And the weight of a non-genetically modified one is 2.8 pounds. So you can see how the money is going to drive this. I mean, obviously, if they can get a six-pound fish out of a salmon instead of a two-pound fish, they're going to want to do that. And they're going to, you know, this is just going to take off. And when at this um, forum that I was at this past weekend, they were just talking about how quickly and dramatically our food system changed when they started introducing the pesticides and the GMOs. It just, you know, um, exponentially multiplied and got into everything so quickly. And the same will happen with our fish. This is just the beginning. You know, they're talking about doing it with meat. They're talking about lab meat. Um, another really interesting um, piece of information that I got was the information about the Beyond Burger and the Impossible Burger and how so many people are looking at this as being the answer to eating less meat. And they have formulated it so that it tastes and represents meat. However, the process of doing that is really not very cool. Uh, the energy um, 
needed to create that impossible burger is much higher than the greenhouse gas emissions from grass-fed meat, if you were to have grass-fed meat. Um, and the ingredients in the burgers have genetically modified ingredients as well. And so it's, it's really a fake, very highly processed product. And every study that we're seeing is showing more and more that we want to go back to real food, try to stay away from the highly processed foods. And that includes some of the fake alternatives. And I'm not talking about tempeh or tofu. Um, you know, those are processed too, to some extent, but they're still made from the real food and there's not fake ingredients going into that process to make it. So, um, really think twice before you start depending on meat alternatives or fake meat alternatives. Um, stick with the real things. Um, if you're going to eat meat, make sure it's grass fed meat, all the same things that I've been saying. But, you know, just when I go to a conference and I hear so many experts talking, it just really, really hits home. Um, also March for science is coming up on May 4th. And we all know that, um, that our current administration does not believe in science and they have not been doing much to resist the global warming that is coming, but it is coming. And so we need to all hit the streets and let our voices be heard when it comes to global warming and what we can do. And so this is the March for Science. This is their annual, um, their annual, March will be taking place at Foley Square on May 4th, starting at noon. And I hope to see many of you there. It's um, We really need to keep up the pressure. And I know it feels like there's a new, um, new march or protest every other week. And practically, you're right. There is. There's so many. But they're all important. And we really need to show up for whichever ones we can. So um, I hope to see some of you there. Um, I also have a petition about the salmon so that you can sign the salmon, um, you know, an anti-GMO salmon petition as well. A um, couple things coming up that I want to share with you on um, April 12th, the Long Island Clean Energy Leadership Task Force is having a, um, a seminar at Malloy College in Suffolk County that you may want to go to um, on Saturday. We are having our Long Island CSA fair that I've been talking to you about. We have over 20 farmers coming out to gather under one roof so that everybody can come around and shop for the right um, community supported agricultural program. That's right for them. Every CSA has different um, offerings. Some are just produce. Some have add-on products like meat, flowers, eggs. Some you pay up front. Some have community work days where you get to participate. Um, some people want to be able to work on the farm. Some people don't. So everything, you know, it's different for everybody. And um, I think one of the most important things for success is that it's convenient for you, whether the drop-off point is convenient or at the pickup at the farm is convenient. Um, there's even some that have delivery services. So you really want to find out which one is the right one for you. On April 15th, the Edible Schoolyard is having their benefit. Um, it's a bit pricey, but it's a worthwhile e event. Alice Waters is their keynote speaker. They'll be honoring her. She started the original Edible Schoolyard many years ago, and this is now supporting Edible Schoolyard NYC. On April 20th, there's a climate-friendly gardener event for an Earth Day celebration. They're going to be screening the film Dirt, followed by a discussion. If you'd like to come out to that, that's out in Huntington on Long Island. On May 2nd, the Long Island Progressive Coalition is having their 40th gala. And then May 4th, like I said, is the March for Science. There's also the Riverkeeper Sweep. Riverkeeper is a great nonprofit organization that works to keep the Hudson River clean. And they have over 200 project, projects going on up and down the Hudson River. So anywhere along the Hudson, you can find a project. Just go to the Riverkeepers website and find a project near you. Also on May 4th, the second annual Women's Diversity Network is having their summit. Um, this is a new nonprofit organization bringing 
diverse women together under one roof to really work on social justice issues and um, a really wonderful opportunity to collaborate with women from many different walks of life. And I'm really looking forward to providing food for that event. It's a luncheon and so many different organizations will be um, participating and donating food for a huge luncheon. So I will be there on May 4th. So actually I won't be at the March, but um, I hope many of you will be there. Um, I want to share with you a recipe. As you all know, Passover is coming up next week. Um, for those that celebrate, you know, there's very, it's really challenging finding a vegetarian main course for Passover. Um, you know, if you eat fish, you're, you're okay. If you eat dairy, you're okay. But if you're trying to stay away from dairy and fish and you have to stay away from the Passover foods that are not, not allowed, like beans and rice, it's really a challenge. So this is a vegetable quinoa paella that I um, reformulated for Passover. Um, my original dish had some chickpeas in it and some green beans in it, and I swapped those out. So this is a great main course recipe for Passover. So you really want to, if you're celebrating Passover and you have vegetarians at your table, this is a great one to hold on to. We're going to start with the ingredients. One onion, chopped. One vegetable bouillon cube. I use a gluten-free vegetable bouillon cube, or you can use um, any vegetable broth that you have. Two teaspoons of saffron threads, a half a teaspoon salt, one teaspoon of minced garlic, two carrots cut into small pieces, two parsnips also cut into small pieces. And when I'm cutting things, um, you know, I'm not doing a Japanese stir fry, so I, I want it more chunky. And so I like to cut the pieces of the carrots and the parsnips on an angle. Then I turn the carrot half a turn, cut another angle, another turn, cut another angle. And this way you get all the pieces of um, carrots and parsnips that you cut are faceted in many areas. And it really looks pretty. Um, I use half a head of broccoli cut into florets, half a head of cauliflower, one bunch of Swiss chard that I chop into thin strips, two cups of Brussels sprouts that I cut in half, four ounces of mushroom sliced, one bunch of asparagus cut into one inch pieces, two cups of spinach, olive oil, one teaspoon of salt, again, two tablespoons of tomato paste, one teaspoon of pipe paprika, one cup of white wine, I use organic white wine, a quarter cup of chopped parsley, one cup of quinoa, and two tablespoons, um, two more tablespoons of chopped parsley for garnishing. And so on a large cookie sheet, I start by roasting um, some of the vegetables. So I roast the cauliflower, the broccoli, the carrots, the parsnips, the Brussels sprouts. Um, I first toss them with a little olive oil and salt, and then roast them in a 375 degree oven. If you want to do them separately because they have different um, roasting times, you can do that or you can put it on one big sheet and just take them off as they're finished. Um, meanwhile, while that's roasting, you can rinse the quinoa and drain it. Saute the onions in a um, large saute pan for about five minutes until they're translucent. Add one and a half cups of boiling water, the bouillon cube, or if you're not, if you're using vegetable broth, just use a one and a half cups of vegetable broth, half a teaspoon salt, and the two teaspoons of saffron threads. Then add the quinoa, reduce the heat to simmer, and let that cook for about 20 minutes until all the liquid is is absorbed. And then you're gonna fluff that up with a fork. Meanwhile, in a large skillet, saute the mushrooms in a little olive oil with one teaspoon of minced garlic. Add the Swiss chard and the asparagus and let that cook for about five more minutes. Add the tomato paste and the white wine. Add the spinach just till it wilts, the salt and pepper um, to taste and cook that until all the liquid has absorbed. Add the parsley and toss it with the quinoa and the roasted vegetables and then garnish it with fresh parsley. Um, again, depending on your dietary restrictions, you can add um some almonds or sesame seeds or something like that if you'd like to have a little bit of crunch to this. Um, and that's it. Really delicious. Um, if you make it, of course, I love to hear how it was for all of you. So um, please let me know. And um, now it's my pleasure to introduce to all of you my guest this week, um, Dr. Vandana Shiva. 
she is um, she was trained as a physicist at the University of Punjab and completed her PhD at the University of Western Ontario in Canada. But she's best known and loved as a food activist and a saver of seeds. Dr. Shiva got her grassroots start as an early critic of Asia's Green Revolution, which was an international effort that began in the 1960s. And the goal was to increase food production in less developed countries through higher yields and um, without the increased, oh, and with the increased use of pesticides and fertilizers. And the Green Revolution increased pollution, caused a loss of indigenous seed diversity and traditional agricultural knowledge, and created a dependence of poor farmers on costly chemicals. So in response, Dr. Shiva founded the Research Foundation for Science, Technology, and Natural Resource Policy in 1982, which was an organization and is an organization devoted to developing sustainable methods of agriculture. And through this organization, scientists have established seed banks throughout India to preserve the country's agricultural heritage, and they also train farmers in sustainable agricultural practices. And in 1991, Dr. Shiva founded Navdanya, which is a national movement to protect the diversity and integrity of living resources, especially native seed, and to promote organic farming and fair trade. And for the last two decades, Navdanya has worked with local communities and organizations serving more than 500,000 men and women farmers. And their results, um, they've managed to conserve more than 3,000 rice varieties from across India. And they've established over 60 seed banks in 16 states across the country. In 2004, Dr. Shiva started Bija Vidi Peeth, which is an international college for sustainable living in Dune Valley, India, in collaboration with the Schumacher College from the UK. And um, Dr. Shiva has been um, known, Time Magazine identified her as an environmental hero in 2003. Asia Week has called her one of the five most powerful communicators in Asia. And in November 2010, Forbes magazine identified Dr. Shiva as one of the seven most powerful women on the globe. She's written more than 20 books, including Biopiracy, uh, Stolen Harvest, The Hijacking of the Global Food Supply, Tomorrow's Biodiversity, Globalization's New Wars, Seed, Water, and Life Forms, and the list goes on. And it was just, it's such an honor and thrill to be able to have this time to sit with Dr. Shiva and talk to her about going forward and what we can all do. Hello. So everyone, I am here right now with Dr. Vandana Shiva, and we are going to talk about the work that she is doing with, um, with genetically modified seeds and raising awareness about the problem. So I thought we might be able to start first by just asking you to share a little bit of your history with us, beginning with what first alerted you to the problems around genetically modified seeds. Well, I'm basically um, a physicist. My training is in physics. I got involved in the ecology movement 50 years ago and uh, got involved in the conservation of biodiversity. I also was asked by my government to advise during the Convention on Biological Diversity at the Earth Summit. And that's the first time I realized how organized the biotech industry was. A little before that, they had been at a meeting on biotechnology where they'd said they're going to patent every seed, every seed will be genetically modified, and five companies will control our food and our health. That was the first alert. But my actual work, my scientific work on assessment and defining the field of biosafety as the scientific assessment of the impact of GMOs on health, on the environment, uh, was really part of the process of the Earth Summit and the United Nations treaties. Uh-huh. Um, and in your work, how are you seeing the seeds affecting the local farmers? Well, the intention of this group of companies, who I name the poison cartel because their expertise <laughs> is making poisons, and they are a cartel right now because they've been reduced to a cartel of three. Monsanto has been bought up by Bayer, 
Syngenta, which is already a very, very big merger, has uh, merged with ChemChina, and Dow has merged with DuPont, and all seed companies of the world, they've either bought out or locked into licensing arrangements. Now, their intention, as they laid out in the 1987 meeting of the United Nations on the laws of life on biotechnology, was that no farmer could have their own seed. That's what they've been attempt attempting now for 31 years. My work began because of this idea of total totalitarianism of a new kind, uh, or control over life itself, I call it bioimperialism, where you want, want to control the last seed and the last farmer. What it has done is even though in countries like India we have not allowed patents on seed, Behind the scene, Monsanto's been behaving as if it has ownership of seed and can collect royalties and rents. They increased the price by 80,000% of cotton seed because the first GMO they brought was uh, beef cotton. cotton. Uh -huh. um, and they did this totally illegally because they don't have a patent in India. They have a patent in America. And in America, they collect, my calculation is, from the treat fee collection for soya and corn, they're collecting about 10 billion from the American farmer. And they've left no alternative. It's so unbelievable. 95% of the corn and soya of the United States is genetically modified. Right. Right. And farmers are paying a royalty. The only reason for genetic engineering is for it to become a rent collection system, like we used to have landlords in feudal times. Right. In these new feudal times, Right. Of the Monsanto drain, we have uh, life lords. Who well, of friends. course, when they first started, they, the intention, so they said, or their, um, their um, stick, what they were trying to push over was that there was going to be higher yields and that we were going to be able to feed the growing population and that we couldn't do it in a sustainable way, which, of course, you and I know is not true. Well, it isn't the case that they started to use the hunger and feeding the world argument in the beginning. Oh, no. At the, you know, at, at the World Trade Organization and the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, which is where these ideas of patenting were being worked out, which is where they were pushing for GMOs mm -hmm. to open the door for patenting, they were only talking about their monopoly and their ownership. They were not justifying it in terms of feeding the world. It was their greed was out naked in the early stages. Ah. It's only when they started to get questioned, they created the fig leaf of feeding the world. Ah, and see. they do it every once in a while. They brought in chemicals in farming and industrial agriculture in the name of feeding the world. They've done GMOs in the name of feeding the world. They're doing the new gene editing and gene drive technologies in the name of feeding the world. They push chemicals in toxics and poisons that are destroying the planet and killing our pollinators and spreading the cancer epidemic, and it's all in the name of feeding the world. It's time for them to stop repeating this lie. There's uh, enough scientific evidence that shows right. that small farms feed the world. The FAO has put out on the World Food Day of 2018 that 80% of the food we is, eat comes is, from small farms. Yep, absolutely. And only 20% is the toxic food these giants right. produce. And yet that's the majority of what we're eating here in this country. No, the U.S. imports hell of a lot. And it, the sad thing is the imports are not taken into the budget of the food. U.S. is a hugely food-importing country. In the U.K., my colleagues woke up to the fact that 95% of their food is imported. They're dependent. And that's when, with the entire threat of climate change, you could have one storm and one rupture of supply, that you could be starving. And that's when they started to ask me to look at the connections between food and agriculture. And that's when I wrote the book, Soil Not Oil, which connects climate change and food security. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks for clarifying that. Mm -hmm. um, I thought there was a law that didn't uh, permit life to be patented, right? And so how do they get away with patenting seeds if seed, as you know, is life? Well... No one even imagined anyone would think of patenting seed. So it was not even thought of as an exclusion in law. Monsanto used 
its power and influence on the US government to start drafting with other companies that were wanting intellectual property monopoly. And they created a com group called Intellectual Property Committee, and they drafted an Intellectual Property Rights Act within what was the General Agreement on tar Trade and Tariffs, which became the World Trade Organization. And the Monsanto representative said, we were the patient, the diagnostician, the physician all in one. We wrote an agreement, we took it to our government and had it imposed on the rest of the world. Now, what they didn't realize is in 87, they had mentioned they were going to use the GATT platform. So I started to work with my government in the GATT, through the GATT ambassador. I started to work with my government back home. And we put exclusions to the drafts that Monsanto had pushed via the US government. They wanted all life patented. And they had said so clearly, the reason we must patent seed is it's the only way to have royalties. And we have to make it illegal for any farmer to have their own seed. That's why we need an international law. They admitted that the US was a very small market for seed compared mm -hmm. to the world of agriculture globally. Mm -hmm. They wanted the whole world. They wanted the tiniest peasant with a quarter acre farm. And we managed to get exclusion. So A, the international law does not force patenting of seed, which is what they wanted. It allows country to exclude patenting on seed. My country has an Article 3J in our patent law, which says plants, animals, and seeds are not human inventions, a simple scientific fact. Therefore, they're not patentable. Similar laws are in Argentina, Article 6 of the Argentinian law. Monsanto is challenging Argentina. It constantly brings up cases against our law. It's become their pattern, they are seeing the, their revenues, the dream of their revenues. If they can increase the seed price by 80,000%, you can imagine how much money there is. 7,000 crores in our currency um, is what they've extracted from the Indian peasant without doing a thing. They didn't create the cotton. They didn't even breed the hybrid BT cotton, they gave 50 grams of seed to the Indian seed industry and said, now multiply, breed, put it into your seeds. They did no work. They just collected rents. They're the ultimate life lords. Hmm. And it's illegal in most countries, and yet they're doing it. Mm -hmm. in, sadly, in the United States, no law was ever passed to prohibit it. Mm -hmm. And it needs, this is something waiting to happen. It needs to be done. So we have to mobilize some of our citizens to get on the bandwagon and, and start working towards exactly. this. Exactly. And I think we are at that particular political moment where it has to come from the ground up. But with certainly not going to come from the ground, from the top down no, with no, our government no. So right from now. the ground up, this is what communities have been doing. They've started creating seed banks and seed libraries. Interestingly, in the year 2004, both in India and in the U.S., these companies managed to get a law passed, which, not in India, they didn't pass it, they drafted it. And the law was about compulsory registration of seed, that you could be a tiny gardener using heirloom varieties in your backyard. But even for that, you had to take permission. And you could be told, no, you can't plant that seed under the compulsory registration law. The minute I saw this mentioned in our papers, I got hold of the draft, and I traveled the length and breadth of my country, waking people up to what this meant. And we collected 100,000 signatures, which I took to our prime minister, and said, we are in the land of Gandhi, mm -hmm. where the British had tried to impose the salt law by basically saying only the British could make salt so that they would have a monopoly on this very, very vital element especially in hot climates where you perspire so much that you need to replenish the salt in your body. And Gandhi walked to the beach in Dandi and picked up the salt from the sea and said, nature gives it for free. We need it for our survival. We will continue to make salt. We will not obey your law. And that salt, Satyagraha as it was called, the force of truth, prevented the British from ever implementing the salt laws. We took inspiration from this and said, Okay, in Gandhi's time it was salt, now it's seed, we are going to do the seed satyagraha. And I took 
this declaration of 100,000 people to our Prime Minister of that time, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh. He said, we are in the land of Gandhi. He said no to the salt laws. We are saying no to your seed mm -hmm. monopoly laws via registration. And you can pass the law we won't obey. And India is a land mm -hmm. of 600 million peasants. Right. Not a tiny amount. Um, in the U.S. at the same time, 2004, a similar law was brought of compulsory registration, and then it lay quiet. About three, four years ago, letters started to go from the U.S. Department of Agriculture or state-level agriculture department officials to seed libraries, these little, little, little packages kept in public libraries for free distribution of seed among the communities. And it started to say this was illegal. It started to say, these letters started to say, it was terrorism to save seeds. Mm -hmm. And I know this happened in Maryland. I know it happened in a number of other states. It happened in California. And they even passed a law that exchange beyond three miles would be illegal. And I was called on to help with this. What do we do? And I said, do what Gandhi did. Do what we did. And um, I said, cross to three miles and one <laughs> point one and share seeds exchange seeds announce uh -huh. that not obeying laws that prohibit you from saving and sharing seed is a high duty it's an ecological duty to the earth because the earth needs us to conserve biodiversity and it's an ecological duty to each other because we need to share seeds and save seeds right. it's the only way good farming is done right Right. Well, one thing you and I share is we both are members of Slow Food. I run my local Slow Food chapter here on Long Island, and I met you in Terra Madre a couple times I've been there. And, um, you know, and seed saving is such a big part of um, the work that Slow Food is doing in, you know, the snail, of, not the snail of approval, but in the um, arc of taste, you know, and I just cooked up um, the seeds of change, and I made a big pot of the Carolini pinto beans that they sent to me and um you know so i'm i really love working with some of these um indigenous seeds that are, that i'm not familiar with and you know not only growing them because i have a large garden that i can't call myself a farmer but i do have a large organic garden that i use as a teaching tool when i work with students and people in my community and i love growing different varieties that i'm not familiar with um you know, I think it's it's really wonderful. One of the um, uh, arc of taste products that we brought back to life is the Long Island cheese pumpkin, which was going extinct. Nobody was eating it. Nobody was growing it. And um, my neighbor, actually, I didn't even know what it was. She said, I have these big gray pumpkins on my property. You want a few of them? And I took some of them and I saved the seed. And now I'm just growing them all over the place. They just you know, and when you were talking yesterday about how seed gives so many from one melon, mm. hundreds of seeds, you know, and so, um, you know, when Puerto Rico had their hurricane, we sent a whole bunch of seeds to Puerto Rico to help them get going. Wonderful. Yeah. So um, I've heard a lot of sad stories about farmers in India committing suicide. Can you talk to us about what's going on there and why that's happening? Well, Indian farmers are very resilient, and uh, suicide has not been a typical response of our farmers in the worst of distresses. But suicides began in the late 90s, and the figure, according to the government, is 310,000, and it all coincides with the time when Monsanto brings it, brings in the BT cotton seeds, the early suicide start in the cotton belt. And uh, my studies show that the debt that led to the suicides is related to the debt because of the seeds and the chemicals that the BT cotton still needs. If your seed price has jumped up 80,000%, and if your claim that the BT cotton will control pests, but it does not, you still get the bollworm attacks, and you get new pests, you have to buy pesticides. None of this the farmers have money for. And usually the company's agents just give it on credit. And then 
have a thumbprint and, right. and have a thumbprint. The farmer has no idea what the price is because this is not a transaction of any formal kind. It's the relationship of trust over hundreds of years that has grown within the local community. And it's usually about two, three years later that the agent comes to the farmer and says, your land is now mine. You didn't pay the debt. And the farmer says, but I never signed my land away. And the agent said, you signed a piece of paper. And they fill in the rest. I call this corporate feudalism because money lending is illegal in India. You can only borrow from formal banks and formal institutions. Money lending, which was a very colonial thing, was made illegal. But Monsanto has brought back money lending through the back door, through its sales agents and the shops that sell chemicals and pesticides. Um, of all the suicides that I have witnessed and recorded, it's the day the, the Monsanto agent as a money lender goes to the farmer and says, your land is mine, that the farmer borrows one last time for a bottle of pesticide, goes to the field, drinks the pesticide, ends his life. Again and again and again, this is how it happens. Not at home. The wife doesn't know because the wife just saw the same cotton seeds. The a GMO cotton seed doesn't look different from a non-GMO cotton seed. It doesn't have horns. Right, right. right. You know, it looks like a cotton seed. And the wife has no idea they're in debt. She has absolutely no idea. And every time I've visited the widow and then I've said, what is the debt for? They pull out a pack, series of packages. Mm -hmm. And they're all BT cotton, BT cotton, BT cotton. And... Uh, it's basically because the farmer's in a state of shock that A, this ancestral land that probably has been with them for 20 generations, he has betrayed his ancestors and the future generations by being made a fool of through the ads and through the false claims. Mm, so and, painful. Uh, it is extremely painful and I call yeah. it a genocide because according to the United Nations, the definition of genocide is a deliberate harm to a community, mm -hmm. physical or otherwise, to either wipe them out or cause them harm. And wiping out farmers on a very, very large scale is a clear genocide. The mm. occupation is farming. It's not an ethnic group. But nothing in the definition of the United Nations says it has to be a group by ethnicity. Right. Right. Femicide is another genocide. So many women are being wiped out with the new kind of forms of violence. So the farmers' suicide, and it's something I, I have continued. It's one area on which I have been hugely attacked by Monsanto as I've co I'm cooking up these figures. And now they've managed to manipulate our government to not release the government data. But we are in the field, <coughs> and we know. <coughs> when farmers have committed suicide, we go to their homes. Right, right. Well, as you know, in our government, um, many of the, we have this revolving door syndrome where people who work on the board in Monsanto or working for Monsanto then work in the government and then they go back to Monsanto and there's this revolving door. So, so the scientific data that they're using to even try to tell us that GMO seeds are safe usually is coming from data that Monsanto has, you know, tests that Monsanto has done. So we're not even seeing any, any independent studies. They, they squash and don't, you know, they ruin scientists' reputations. You know, they're doing that all over the place um, just to squash anything that might come out that's negative. I have watched the revolving door during those early negotiations. Before the 1992 Convention on Biological Diversity, after the convention, because I worked with my government and others to say GMOs need assessment on the impact of biodiversity. So we put in Article 19.3 .3 in the Convention on Biological Diversity. This then led to the United Nations saying we need a protocol. And since I was among the very few people who was talking about all of this in the early 90s, they appointed me on the expert group. I was the only non-governmental member. Uh, everyone else was from government. Now, throughout those negotiations, it used to be the case that one time the same face would come as Monsanto briefing the government from behind. Next time, the person would be sitting as a representative of the U.S. government. 
U.S. government has been totally hijacked by the poison cartel. Yeah. And the regulatory agencies have been deregulated, Mm -hmm. which is why we need a very deep revolution around the safety of our environment and safety of our food. Because the agencies that were supposed to protect us are now working for those who are put making a threat, both to the planet and our health. And yep. never, uh, uh, never before, never before in human history has a dictatorship been global. Hitler was a dictator. There was fascism in Spain. Mussolini was there in Italy. That was it, three countries. Could be dealt with because the rest of the world organized. Now, these corporations are everywhere in the world, and they're establishing their dictatorship everywhere. And if governments ban them, Honduras, there was a coup when there was a ban on GMOs. Mm-hmm. In my country, they just changed the officials. They changed the minister. We've lost a minister who was saying no to GMO mustard. Um, so not only is it the first time ever you have a global dictatorship, it's the first time ever it's a dictatorship based on wiping life out on the earth. Yeah. And, well, and, I know our government and, even, um, you know, in relief grain that they were giving to nations in Africa, the African nations didn't want to take it, and we threatened if you don't take our GMO grain, we won't give you money towards AIDS relief and towards medical issues. Well, I remember they, two times very clearly. In 1999, we had a super cyclone. It was called the Urissa supercyclone, 300 kilometers velocity. And uh, I started immediately to work on rehabilitation. We had saved salt-tolerant seeds, which we could distribute, because with a cyclone and hurricane, salt water comes onto the land. But because we've been saving seeds through Navdanya, my movement, if those your, of your listeners want to know more I about it, I want to talk it, about that. I'll ask uh, they should go to the website of Navdanya and to the website of Seed Freedom. So we were distributing native seeds, and the farmers were saying, we don't want to eat the food relief that they are getting. And I picked out a sample. It was basically from the U.S., and um, I had it sent to the United States for testing. It was GM corn and soya. So I immediately wrote to my government, because GMOs were not allowed, and said, you've got to prohibit it. The government of India said it will not be distributed anymore. I also wrote to the U.S. ambassador and said, this is not right. And we were told, well, Americans are eating it and beggars can't be choosers. In South Africa, there was, in the southern cone, a major drought. And I remember this was 10 years after the Earth Summit, so it was 2002. And the big issue was going on. The U.S. was saying... You have to have our GMO corn as seed. And the African nations were saying you can give it as flour so that it doesn't spread. And the Europeans said, we will give you cash. You buy wherever you want to. Mm. And that is what neutralized the American blackmailing. That is why Africa stayed GMO-free. Most of Africa is still GMO-free. Southern Af- South Africa is gone they try in Malawi. Burkina Faso got um, um, GMO cotton, but they've thrown it out. So uh, the issues of GMOs are unsettled. Most countries are GMO-free. Most crops are GMO-free. And all we have is a cartel of three, corrupting every government, destroying every regulatory agency. Uh-huh. We have to get much more imaginative how to deal with them. That is why I worked with movements around the world to organize a Monsanto tribunal. And that tribunal in The Hague is what set the fearlessness in the movement. That's how the court cases started. That's how Johnson's case was won. won. Wasn't that great? (laughs) And that's how the buyer uh, market value started to collapse. I mean, it takes one cancer case and one story of truth to bring down 35% of the value of these giants. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine if we just stick to the truth and our fearlessness, we can bring them down. That's a great way to stop for a minute. We're going to take a couple minute break, and when we come back, I really want to hear about what we can all do to mobilize, and also there's a real new scary genetically modified um, 
issue coming up that I want you to talk about. So everyone listening, don't go anywhere. I'm talking with Dr. Vandana Shiva, and we'll be right back. Thanks. Welcome back, everyone. You're listening to Bhavani at IE Green on the Progressive Radio Network, and I'm here with Dr. Vandana Shiva, and we're talking about GMO seeds and what we can all do to empower ourselves to put up a fight against the powers of the corporations taking over our seed. So, Dr. Shiva, can you tell us about this new type of um, genetic editing that they're talking about? I think another name for it is CRISPR. Um, that's really scary, and they're saying that it's not genetically modified, so they're not going to have to label it at all. So when we started to work on the Convention on Biological Diversity and we created the framework convention on biosafety called the Cartagena Protocol, genetic engineering did not say it has to be a transgenic, where you take a gene from another organism and put it here. Any disturbance of the genome changes the living organism. It doesn't matter how you do it. You could do it by adding a gene from another organism. You could do it by gene editing. It has consequences. The very scientists who are working on gene editing, on the CRISPR techniques, have found out that for one edit, there are 1,500 unpredictable changes in the genome. Now, can you imagine if this was happening in your computer? You know, the sad thing is a big driver of this is Bill Gates, and he thinks the whole world is a word program where cut and paste works. But if cut and paste in word had to work like gene editing is working in living organisms, every time you edit and you have 1,500 unpredictable changes in your text, no one could write a book. No one could write a script. We would be in a mess. Right. But the difference between a word program which is just a text. And life. And, and life is life is self-organized. Right. Life is constantly, constantly changing. changing. Just like how and we've, we've remodified, we have now have um, super, super weeds and super insects, you know, exactly. because they mutate and they change to survive. And the very to technology survive. of CRISPR, the very idea of CRISPR, was basically watching to see how nature defends herself from invasions of viruses and bacteria. And they found that a living organisms ab- take a piece of the invading organism and basically defend themselves by making it part of their system. So if from outside you're imposing such a system, the organism is reorganizing itself 1,500 places to create new defense mechanisms. So the, the mechanistic language, that this is accurate, this is precise, that it is not a GMO, is so false, and this has been proven false by the European Court of Justice, which has ruled that it is a GMO, and it will be regulated like GMOs. Sadly, the U.S. is so much in control of these companies. Well, these companies are so much in control of the U.S. (laughs) government. (laughs) That they basically have said they won't regulate and say it's not a GMO. It's so scary. For me, the two aspects of the GMO question, both the old transgenics and the new, the CRISPR and gene editing, is first and foremost, it it is the ultimate technological hubris. When you know so little about how life works, you take out a gene gun and shoot a gene. That's how the old GMOs were made. Or you do a cut and paste without knowing anything about how the system organizes itself. You have no idea about the self-organization of the system. You have no idea of what your chopping and pasting is going to do to the organism. So the first is the technological hubris. The second is the fact that it's all for greed, limitless greed. In 1987, the meeting that triggered me to start saving seed, the industry said so clearly, we're going to use genetic engineering to take patents on life. Long before, it's only four or five years old, this CRISPR technique. And yet, if you look at the number of patents that have been taken, and Bill Gates, who on the one hand looks like a philanthropist, giving funding to research to solve the problem of hunger around the world, is also created a company called Editas, whose main job is taking patents. Oh, really? Again, for profit. Editas, its name is Editas, Editing Life. Wow. 
It's unbelievable. Yeah. You, know, so you would I have think a he's such book. a smart guy that he would no. know better. He knows well. That's why he thinks everyone else is dumb. And uh, he can make a fool of the world through his philanthropy croak. And my new book, Oneness Versus the One Percent, which is out in many countries, but and it should be out in the United States sometime later in the year. It's called Oneness Versus the One Percent. It's a very, very big part on Bill Gates because he now is the driver. What's basically happened in the last 10, 15 years of deregulation of finance mm -hmm. and deregulation of commerce is basically that the billionaires have become super rich. And the billionaires are now controlling the corporations. Right. So the big shares in all of the companies are now the investment funds who manage the billionaires' money. The two big investment funds are BlackRock and Vanguard. And they are driving so much of the push because for them, there's only one calculation. How do I make more money? How do I make more money? More than 25%, more than 30%, more than 50%. And the only two ways you make more money, create total monopolies on very vital issues like seed and life. And the second is play the casino. Wow. Wow. That's funny because I actually thought Vanguard was, you know, as far as investment companies, I thought they were doing more socially responsible investing, but I guess not. They have, have to. They, they, when I did the book, they were the top on control of Bayer, Monsanto, and all of these poison uh -huh. Uh -huh. What's also so uh, unbelievable is there's a lot of people that think um, just breeding, you know, genetic breeding for like drought resistant seeds is the same thing as genetic modification. And obviously it's not, you know, trying to get varieties that can withstand certain um, environmental changes is different than genetic modifying. Can you explain yeah, so that a little? Yeah, so there are four kinds of breeding. The breeding that farmers have done for millennia. And farmers breed. Otherwise right. you couldn't have got out of one wild plant called a rice sativa, 200,000 varieties of rice that the Indian farmers gave to the world, including right. the wonderful basmati. Which is, a, which is a positive thing, right? Of course. That's a, a positive thing. Right. Or the Mexicans took a plant called teosinte and turned it into the thousands of varieties. That's breeding. Of corn. And it's breeding, yeah, it's corn. Breeding through open pollination and then selection. You select the best in the field with a very, very careful... And then you crossbreed well, those. Two. No, you don't have to no. crossbreed. Nature's crossbreeding for you. The pollinators okay. are cross. That's why they're called open pollinated. Okay. Then you have the crossbreeding. First generation high yielding to crossbreed in order to have higher tolerance of chemicals, which was the Green Revolution varieties. And the hybridization through male sterility which is the hybrids which don't breed true. And here the main objective is so that farmers are forced to buy seed every year. In crossbred varieties, they can save. But the problem with a lot of crossbreeding that's done for chemicals is the varieties are very, very prone to disease and pest infestation. So farmers have to give it up, not because the seed can't be saved, but because it started to become very diseased. The f then is the genetic engineering where you interfere at the genetic level. And the difference is this. All prior breeding was the whole genome, interacting with the whole genome. Right. Now, the, ge the plants are intelligent, and this is now coming out in all the scientific literature. So when I take a plant A and a plant B within the same family, and I mix it, the plant as a whole is making all the corrections and throwing out the undesirable traits. But when I shoot with a gene gun, not even knowing where in the genome that introduced gene will go, and I add an antibiotic resistance marker, and I add a viral promoter. And you add something that's not in the same family. You are giving, and basically it's a transgene. Right. Basically, you are not allowing the plant to use its intelligence. You are literally shooting at the plant. Even gene editing is a violent technique that is preventing the plant or the living organism from self-regulating because right. all living systems 
are based on self-organization and self-regulation. The denial of that self-regulation in treating a plant as pieces of machinery that you can put together at will, that is the first scientific flaw of genetic reductionism and genetic determinism, which is the foundational philosophy of all genetic engineering, both the transgenic as well as the gene editing. And it is a failed technology. It's a failed technology when you look at what did they promise and what did it do. BT crops were supposed to control pests. We've got super pests. Roundup Ready crops were supposed to control weeds. We've got super weeds. And now the same group, Bill Gates and DARPA, the defense system, are coming out with gene drives to say, oh, the amaranth became a super weed. Let's make it extinct through gene drives. You don't need to work in such clumsy ways with the living world. We have more sophisticated ways. I practice nonviolent agriculture. I practice agriculture based on biodiversity. And we produce more food. We produce more nutrition. Our farmers earn better. We have more pollinators. The soil has more living organisms. We have more water. The water on our farm has come up 70 feet. And on any indicator that you want to assess, we have far more nutrition in our crops. It makes no sense mm-hmm. to not go the nonviolent way. Can I ask, are most of the farmers in India doing more um, multi- diversity within their farms and also using animals in their farm? Or are most of them, you, they're not doing so much monocropping there, no, are the, they? No, tr- uh, the farmers traditionally have never done monocropping. And Indian farming uh, spread the idea of mixtures and biodiversity. Of this course. is what Sir Albert Howard learned. And Albert Howard is called the founder of modern organic farming. But he learned it from India when he was sent to change India's farming. And he said, but the Indian farmers are so sophisticated. The fields are fertile. There are no pests. I'm going to learn from them. They will be my professors. And he wrote the book called Agricultural Testament, which was published by Rodale Institute, because Rodale came to visit Albert Howard. And uh, that's how the organic movement grew. Um, So diversity is very, very much the way we farm. Wherever the green revolution has been imposed, or BT cotton has been imposed by the Monsantos of the world, we get monocultures. And wherever there are monocultures, there are problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's what I think the movement really has to work towards, getting everyone back to a more ecologically diverse farming um, I think whether, whether it is the diversity in nature or it is the diversity in culture, we have to start becoming more conscious of diversity and celebrating it more. Because all the hate politics that is spreading everywhere is based on intolerance of diversity. And all of the, plan, and all of the planetary assault is basically extermination through pesticides and weedicides and this poison and that poison and claiming it's necessary for growing food. You don't have to make farms so big that care must disappear. Right. Well, like you said, most people are being fed by small family farmers. Yeah, yeah. So exactly. Most of the planet. And most farms, you know, I've written a book called Who Really Feeds the World? It was done for the uh, Milan Expo, which was dedicated to food. And uh, it's uh, published in the United States by North Atlantic Press. And uh, in the book... I point out so clearly that American farms aren't owned by farmers anymore. Right. 90% farms are owned by financial institutions. Absolutely. And I companies. actually wrote about um, you know, the subsidy checks. You know, part of our problem is yes. that we have this whole subsidies of the farmers, you know, the big farmers that are growing the commodity crops, and the subsidies aren't going to any of the small organic farmers, and that these subsidies, most of them are getting mailed to, like, penthouses in New York City. They're not getting mailed out into Idaho and Ohio and where exactly. the farms are. Those, the, far, the people that own the farms aren't doing the farming. So when I was working on the World Trade Organization, both on the intellectual property issue as well as the agriculture agreement, which was written by Cargill, Cargill vice president became your representative to write the agreement on agriculture and the sanitary and phytosanitary agreement written by the Nestle's and the Pepsi's and the Coca-Cola's. At that time, I remember we had such intense debates. The international subsidy is $400 billion to agribusiness. That's more than a billion dollars a day. 
And it's going to those who own and control the land, not those who work the land. Right. And now that they're talking about farming without farmers, and they're talking about driverless tractors and machines which have they no human They want everybody out of work. <laughs> they want everybody out of work, but they want control. And they want our tax money to subsidize them. That's why no matter what indicator... It's time to shut down the industrial system. It's time to shut down corporations in, in, in industry. We have to stop making agriculture a place for super profits for the 1%. Right. We have to a make commodity. agriculture a place for healing the earth, healing human communities, and giving work to the last hands. Wherever I go and I ask young people, what do you want to do? They want to farm. Because they're intelligent enough to know what's happening to the planet. Mm -hmm. They're intelligent enough to know what's happening to our health. And they realize the single most important contribution they can make is care for the land through good farming. And I think it's not fair that penthouses in New York control the land with right. the young people. We need a land reform of a whole new imaginative kind. Oh, you're so right. We really do. <laughs> well, on that note, um, I just want to thank you so much for joining me today. This has been wonderful. I will share your... Um, all your websites and how people can get in touch with you on my website so that people who are listening to this can find you and reach out to you because you have some great programs in India. We, we offer courses because we yeah. realize this learning, right? how to live right. on this earth and how to farm. Um, in an what is your school violent. called? Um, it's called the uh, Earth University and the School of the Seed. Right, right. Yeah. So um, anyway, I hope to visit there sometime. Mm -hmm. And everyone listening, I want to thank you for joining us. And I will see you all again next week. Bye for now. Bye-bye.